The players are ready. We're ready. We know that you're ready. Five days of Worlds Week are about to come to a pulsating climax. Patrick Chapin against Shahar Shenhar for the World Championship. Let's get this party started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you are around the world. Welcome to the final of the Magic the Gathering World Championship for 2014. Rich Hagen sitting alongside Brian David Marshall and Randy Bueller. There you see Patrick Chapin, the innovator, the Pro Tour Journey into Knicks champion, back at his second World Championship final. It has not been done before. 2007, he finished runner-up to Uri Peleg of Israel. Can he go one better here? His his opponent back for a second world's final himself. Both players there. Shahar Shenhar of Israel, your reigning, defending world champion. Brian David Marshall, who wins? I have to pick Chapin here. Uh, you know, I've, I've been so impressed with not only his play here, but his uh, anticipation of this moment from the moment he won Pro Tour Journey into Knicks. Randy Bueller, same question. Who wins? I'll pick Shahar. <laughs> I think if I'd gone first, I might have picked Patrick, but uh, I mean, I think it's really close. I do think Shahar's deck, if he can get to the mid game, get toward the late game, he has the better positioned deck for this matchup. I mean, the reason the, the case for Patrick is more that he's better with abs on mid range than anybody else. The Sadisi whip has been beating Abs on mid-range relatively consistently, except it never beats Patrick. So there you see, Shahar Shenhar begins with a thought sees. He sees Siege Rhino, he sees Sorin, Solemn Visitor, he sees Murderous Cut, and he sees uh, a somewhat different arted thought sees on the other side of the table. Sylvan Carrioted, the only non-land permanent currently on the battlefield, that's from Chapin. M much like Patrick Chapin himself, it's a throwback thought sees. <laughs> <laughs> there you see Shahar's hand, it includes Ashiok, Nightmare Weaver, you see on the right-hand side of your screen, Corsa, Hero's Downfall, Sidisi the Brute Tyrant, at a thousand miles away right now, but who knows how this game could go long, Hornet Queen for four and triple green. Interestingly, the deck that uh, Shahar's playing is a deck that uh, Willie huh. Adel built. Hmm. And uh, he, he did not ultimately like the Ashioks in the main, and when he played in the World, Champ World Magic Cup, he put them back in the sideboard. Mm. So we will not see Sorin, Villa, Sorin Solemn Visitor, at least uh, not that copy uh, from Patrick Chapin. And uh, just looking at his <laughs> list, he pa has one more. Patrick goes right to see Drano. Yeah. Turn three, why not? It takes Ashiok out of play for sure, right? Turn three, Ashiok, no good. Shahar's going to have to deal with this Rhino first. Which he can, should he choose to. And the fact that he's got rid of a Planeswalker already uh, means using the hero's downfall is less of an issue, perhaps. Yeah, uh, Patrick's Planeswalkers are definitely one of the ways he can win this game. Shahar has three hero's downfalls in his list. That's one more than Yamamoto had in the semis. And he does use it uh, just before Patrick's attack step. Breaks a fetch land, gets a swamp, ran into issues with the pain lands we saw earlier <laughs> against you, yeah. Not that he can get those. So let's have a thought. He's back the other way, give a, a bunch of information out, and Patrick Chapin will go to work writing down the cards that we have already seen from Shahar's hand the Ashok, the Corsa, the Sidisi, and the Hornet Queen. I have to, does Patrick take the Ashiok here because he doesn't have an answer for it? Well, he might have to. Yeah, his hand is murderous cut and two land. Yeah, so he does He does actually end up taking the Ashiok. Planeswalker's gone on both sides of the board then, without uh, getting as far as the battlefield. Five cards for Shenhar. Added a thought sees. 
Now, he still has very good information about Chapin's hand. Is the value here to firing off another thought sees, Randy, or is this safe for later time? I mean, I think it depends whether he wants to play Sidisi. His curve says play Sidisi. Mm -hmm. So we've seen this sequence a lot. Uh, someone plays yeah. the Sidisi with the ability on the stack, use a removal spell. When the cards go to the graveyard, Sidisi is not there anymore. Ooh. And even if you would get a zombie... <sighs> With City C in play, you don't, because yeah. it's not there. That ooh from Randy Bueller is not about the land, and it is not about another copy of Sidisi. It's about that top card of the graveyard with the shining orange beacon of mythicness <laughs> on it, Soul of Innistrad. We may see that play a pivotal role here in game one in the best three out of five, remember. As we do see another Planeswalk, <laughs> and this time... Patrick Chapin goes for a Johnny Mentor of Heroes. He has one copy of it in his main deck. There you see a Johnny. A lot of words on that one. Yeah, pa Patrick's uh, choice of deck here owes a lot to Ari Lax's deck, that one Pro Tour Kanta Tarkir. He's obviously made some uh, some changes and adjustments to it, but he, re he really liked the Planeswalker package from Ari's deck. Uh, so you can't always tell uh, with a Jani because both the first abilities are plus one uh, just by looking at the dice to see how the loyalty works. But he, of course, went to look at the top four cards. And uh, whiffed. Right. And, and Chapin's empty. Yep. That is, in fact, the cards in hand on the screen. But a Johnny is going to help him do something about that, one would think. Well, I mean, that's the plan. And eventually. I know, well, he doesn't have eventually because of Soul of Innistrad. I mean, I know I talked to Patrick over lunch, and he was saying they, that card is such a trump. If it gets randomly spilled into the graveyard, it's just this looming, dooming, you know, sort of Damocles hanging over his head. So we see uh, two course of crew fix, a hero's downfall, and a sylvan caryatid were the four cards revealed by the six loyalties on a Johnny Mentor of Heroes. The Corsa comes down, and we will need to see the top card of a library. And it's a land. So that will go into play in time-honored fashion. Yeah, Patrick did not want to see a follow-up land there. Shahar will shuffle away the land that was on his uh, next lo looming draw horizon. S surprised to see Evolving Wilds in a, in a standard deck, Randy? A little bit. I mean, but it does. You have so much of, I guess, so much of your deck uh, where you're looking at the top of it and you have so much information, I guess, the extra shuffles, maybe? Well, it's also the case that uh, there aren't enemy color, dual, uh, enemy color fetch lands, right? Your, fetch, your polluted deltas can go get blue and black, but you want to be able to get forests, and it can get a forest or a swamp or an island. Like, it is the only the only fetch land that can do that. We're, we're getting close to uh, Hornet Queen range. We really are. Only one away right now. Murderous Cut is on top for that man, the Israeli Shahar Shenhar. So, Thoughtsies uh, reveals information. Sata Wayfinder to go with that Hornet Queen plus a forest in hand for Shahar. So he will get to seven mana, and of course he will have three green uh, readily available. On top oh, of I Chapin's think. library now is more land. I think we're going to see Shahar pass the turn to activate uh, the soul. He's only got five. Yeah. Ah. He went with uh, Thoughtseize. See what's going on. And Chaper will take another look at the top four. We already knew about the land. There's a Corsa, a land, and a Bremaz, King of Areskos. He's got two copies of Bremaz. And that middle ability on the Johnny Mentor of Heroes. Yeah, this is Pat's late game. Right? He does not have Whip of Erebos. He mm. does not have Horned Queens. His game is Planeswalkers. That's what's supposed to push him over the top at the end. The other thing he doesn't have by, in game one, by the way, is any way to deal with Horned Queen. <laughs> like The card Horned Queen is devastating against Patrick's deck. 
that you get a look at the legendary cat soldier, Brimas King of Vereskos, that is now on the battlefield at the top uh, of Chapin's uh, curve wow. there, you see. Here is Hornet Queen, seventh land, income, not just two Flying Death Touch Hornet Queen, but four one one Flying Death Touch tokens. And the board is getting very busily packed. Life total still high for both players. But now with the Air Force on Jahar Shenhar's side of the board, that a journey mentor of heroes may not stay unmolested for long, but we'll see. Yeah, there's, there's basically nothing Patrick can do about the Hornet Queen. I mean, it's, it's essentially a five for one. And, oh, by the way, there's Whip of Erebos on top of Shahar's library to potentially bring it back. Ugh. Thoughts he's on top for Chapin. A single utter end in Chapin's list can deal with the Whip. Main deck. Right. Yeah. Keep in mind, he brings in some 13 cards in this match. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just saying that... Uh, Unlike in the semifinals, where Patrick got a game one, which was able to just kind of right. win it relatively quickly, game one goes long, Patrick's in a lot of trouble, and that's basically what's happened here. So, Ajani will tick up once again. No, there's the other end. Now on the bottom, near the bottom anyway. And a Wingmate Rock is up on top. The one Wingmate Rock in his main deck. Yeah, that Hornet Queen's so good. I mean, the reason people play Hornet Queen is to play it against Abzan. He's good in a lot of matchups. This is the one where... You can just naturally get to seven mana and cast it. Right. right. He's 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 good in play against everybody, but you know <laughs> some, there are some he's decks fast that don't, enough to hard cast. There, in this there match, are some though. decks that just don't give you the time to get to play him. Patrick's deck is not yep. one of those. Surely the Hornet Queens are her. Her, yes. I've jet lagged my gender pronouns. Sorry. Get an Ashiok involved and really confuse you. <laughs> Two mana for Sator Wayfinder. Let's have a look at the top. There's a Corsair of Crewfix there. And uh, in fact, three land to go with Corsair of Crewfix. And <sighs> another Hornet Queen on top of the library for Shahar Shenhar. And there's Whip of Erebos. So although the board is looking very busy and there's Planeswalkers and Bremaz and Corsa, well, things are starting to get out of hand here on the right-hand side of the table with that Whip of Erebos, you see. Now all those creatures have lifelink in addition to just, you know, flying and death touch. Yeah, if, you, if you've looked in on any matches this weekend and seen a board state where, you know, a game stall where someone was at 72 life, uh, it's probably been because of Whip of Erebos. Mm-hmm. Not a Johnny's ultimate? Oh, I wish. Huh. So, in come the flyers, aiming at a Johnny mentor of heroes. The queen is the guy, is the flyer left on defense. Shahar mm -hmm. would love the, the opportunity to block with Hornet Queen. Get it into the <laughs> graveyard. <laughs> Please attack me. Please kill my creature. Chapin will draw Wingmate Rock, and Thoughtseize, which seems to be the story of this game one, uh, he just can't seem to not see them. Um, here's another one on top of his library. Uh, but he will up the loyalty on Ajani to take a look at that Thoughtseize plus three more. Land, land, and I think Hero's downfall. Swing and a miss. So now Sylvan Carrioted on top. Seven Carotid and Hornet Queen, the cards on top. One of those is a little bit better right now. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. One of the one of the things the Obzon deck doesn't have that you see a lot of uh, maybe like the Green Black, Black Constellation decks that sort of fill that same spot in the metagame for a lot of players is, is there's no Doomweight Giant to deal with right. the Hornet Queens. Right. Hornet Queen is a lot of the reason why so many Doomweight Giants are running around. You know, everybody's got Drown in Sorrow or Anger or End Hostilities in their sideboard so that you can recover from a position like this. 
Doom Wake Giant is a card you can put in the main deck that helps you recover from a position like this. Not in Patrick's deck, though. Life totals currently going up. It's really interesting to me how Shahar, three Grand Prix wins and a Worlds win, and now here he's back in the finals and, and looks sure looks like he's going to go up a game in the finals, but with the no Pro Tour top eights. Hmm. It's interesting how this, you'd think of the Pro Tours as being this kind of in-between tournament in terms of difficulty in between the Grand Prix and the Pro Tour and the, the World Championships. Okay, Wingmate Rock, sure. That'd be... <laughs> It'll help clog the board up for a turn or so. Uh, but I think that part of what's going on is that Shahar's the kind of guy that the longer he gets to play a format, the better he gets at it. Right? He's a tuner, and you know, he's, he goes so deep with his technical play that you know, when he gets time to truly understand all the intricacies of the, of the decks and the matchups, he's, he just gets to be the, the, one of the best players in the world. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that the Pro Tours are fresh formats may not play to his strengths as much as it plays to the strengths of mm. you know, some of the, the innovators of the world. A nope. Sam Black, for example. Or a Patrick, Patrick Chapin. Chapin. Yeah, pun very much intended there. Sure. I mean, I fully expect to see him in a Pro Tour Top 8 just, kind of uh, any tournament Did he now. just blank on his polluted Delta? <laughs> I think he, yeah, I think that was polluted Delta and whiff. But it's interesting how Worlds and the Grand Prix are in this sort of, are sort of more similar, especially from a, you know, constructed point mm. of view than the Pro Tours are. Sidisi on top right now. So you can see both Sidisi and Whip on screen, though not yet paired up. So whip back a Hornet Queen, get four fresh wasps. Yeah, and we're at the point where Obs on midrange is called midrange, not Obs on control. <laughs> um, and midrange kind of happened a few turns ago now. Yeah. Control happens in games two and three of sideboarding. Right. And four and five. And four and five. Yeah, there are, there are no cards in Pat, Patrick's deck that can get him out of this. The cards that can get him out of this are in the sideboard. Now, interestingly, Patrick does not have any Drown and Sorrows in his sideboard. Right. I mean, that's a card that a lot of Obson decks do have for this reason. There you go. Scoop them up. It is 1-0 to Shahar Shenha. He leads. And that means that Patrick Chapin will have to turn to his sideboard and find some answers that will win him at least three of the next four maximum games. He is 1-0 down in the best three out of five. But he has 15 cards to work with, as we all do when we sideboard. Why don't we take a look at what Patrick Chapin has in store? Lots of ones there. Singletons include Utter End, Glare of Heresy, Murderous Cut, Planeswalker Liliana Vess, Ditto, Nissa World Waker, and Dune Blast, and then more. Two Anna Fens are the foremost, two Read the Bones, two End Hostilities, and the biggest contribution to the sideboard, three Barblight Randy. Any sense of what goes on here? Yeah, no, no Drown in Sorrows, but he does have three sweepers. The two End Hostilities and the Dune Blast are absolutely crucial to preventing Hornet Queen shenanigans from just getting completely out of control. Those are the most important cards. The other card which is crucial to this matchup is Anafenza the Foremost. The ability of Anafenza to just prevent creatures from going to the graveyard is good against Sidisi. It's also good against Whip. It's also a three-mana 4-4. Four -four. You, you, also, you also mentioned uh, sweepers. Bileblight's quite the sweeper. Sure. In, in this matchup where you, you have, you know, four, eight... Wasps no, and, and hilariously, you bioblight the tokens away, leaving the queen herself in play, which is almost better than a drown in sorrow. <laughs> like you'd rather have the queen in play and just fine, I'll take two. Elspeth versus Hornet Queen. Elspeth can make twenty-one tokens before the queen herself can take down Elspeth. Yeah, if a, if a queen doesn't have followers, she's just a hornet. Exactly. Yeah, the the glare of heresy is about the only card you can reliably say Patrick won't bring in in this matchup. Right. Uh, I, I don't. I don't believe he's bringing in the Nissa in this match, but it's, you know it's entirely possible. Sure. 
All right, so uh, looking for sweepers on the Patrick Chapin side of the board to uh, get out of the way of Hornet Queen and her many followers. What about the other side of the matchup? Let's take a look at Shahar Shenhar for you, and we'll see what he has to offer. Again, plenty of singletons. There's Ashok Nightmare Weaver, Drown in Sorrow, Soul of Innistrad, Farika, God of Affliction, and Dig Through Time. The twos are Reclamation Sage and Sultide Charm, and then two sets of threes. He also has three Bile Blight, but his other three is Disdainful Stroke, one of the real big cards of the week, Brian David Marshall. Yeah, Disdainful Stroke, I imagine, would be maybe the three first cards he slams into his main deck configuration in this matchup, knowing especially what Patrick's going to be doing after sideboard with... Uh, some sweepers of his own, some sweepers that he'll be bringing in. Uh, the, the I, I, mean, I think Solid in Estrada is the first card I, that gets Windmill slammed in. <laughs> right. But that's fine. The strokes, yeah. you can be excited yeah. about the strokes. The Soul is the most exciting card so, here. So, uh, Farika God of Affliction also, for, for a lot of the same reasons, I think is going to come in here because he gets to rebuild after and end sure. hostilities. Yeah, it can help if the, when the game goes Assu grindy. Assuming he can deal with the Anoffensive first. Well, yeah. I think uh, Ashiok is also coming in. I mean, I think that the reason that the two Ashioks are in his main deck already is for these mid range matchups. Uh, Shahar definitely likes that card. Thinks it's well positioned for these the grindy long game matches against green decks. Mm -hmm. And then you just always go for a dig through time. Yeah, I mean if you're not getting attacked by, you know, fire drinker satyrs or battle wise hoplites, yeah, sign me up. Eight the, mana cards. The Bring soul of Innistrad that we've seen uh, Randy going into Shahar's graveyard. Um, is that something on the other side of the table that you're able to uh, ignore in terms of the mental energy whenever cards are getting flipped into the graveyard, graveyard, or is there a slightly sort of sick feeling as they're going, oh, okay, here's Sidisi, I'm going to just uh, put some more cards in my graveyard. Is there a Soul of Innistrad there? Is there? Is there? How do you, how do you sort of feel about that, sort of on an emotional level, I guess? I, I think it's in between, actually. I right. think that it's important to keep track of whether there's a Soul of Innistrad randomly in the graveyard or not, because mm -hmm. I think it changes the way you have to play. Like, strategically, and I mean, emotionally, I don't think Patrick is very, very emotional. I mean, sure. he wants this, but he's he's all business. I mean, he's right. been in this seat before. He's not going to get distracted by the emotions of the moment. But you know what? If when he sees the soul gets built into the graveyard, he knows he has to maybe gamble and try to win a little bit faster. He knows he has to try to close the game before the soul has time to matter. Speaking of people who've been in this seat before, sure. Uh, Hall of Famers, Patrick Chapin, obviously a Pro Tour Hall of Famer. Uh, Hall of Famers who've been in a World Final. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick Chapin is one of them. He, sure. he already was in a World's Final. Uh, John Finkel, Bob Marr, Kai Buda, Ben Rubin, Frank Karsten, Patrick Chapin, Makihito Mahara, and Guillaume Wafatapa. Wow. The winners are Finkel, Buda, and Mahara. Uh, you have a whole Pretty bevy of. Hall of Famers who've been in a uh, in a top eight or a top four, but you know there have been zero repeats before this weekend of players in a final. Yeah, that's crazy. And Nobody, you have not both only of them. not only has there never been a repeat world champion, there's never even been somebody who's repeated a finals appearance. Yeah, and now we have two players repeating their finals appearance here in this match. Yeah, it certainly helps that the tournament is only 24 players now. Sure. I mean, some of these stats were going to, I mean, these things were going to happen. I tell you what, though. But yeah, yeah, from that point of view, that's true. But also, let's remember that some of the world's uh, matches in the past, where you had um, a lot of pro players up the top end, and then you sort of combined it with the world team competition. You had players you know, who were the number three seed on relatively small countries with not a ton of magic experience. And a lot of day one, you look at the top of the standings after day one of worlds in... 2003 and 2006 and 2008 and you see a lot of big names up at the top because they got to play against a standard that was not quite Hall of Fame standard. You look at day one of the World Championship here and you start with a player of the year followed by a Hall of Famer followed by a Pro Tour champion and then you're at 0-3 and out of the draft and let's start playing, playing constructed. Yeah, no, it is, is the toughest field ever assembled. This tournament every year is the toughest tournament of the year in terms of the quality of the field. It's just a little bit less variance when you've got only 24 players. Yeah, o almost uh, almost as many Hall of Famers have been in the top eight, by the way. 24 players in this event, 23 Hall of Famers <laughs> have been in the top eight or top four of a world's. 
Uh, Shah Shenha ends up uh, sending his hand back. I think we saw a, a look that saw just one land and six spells. That's relatively straightforward. Uh, for Patrick Chapin, he has a pretty land-heavy draw as well. Looks like to me like he had five land, uh, a Bile Blight, one other, uh, and so... And an Elspeth. And yeah, Elspeth, that's right, yeah. Good um, eyes, good eyes, Rich. Yeah, so, I don't know. I... Obviously, the Shahar Mulligan is pretty straightforward. Were, were you would you have been tempted, Randy, by the the Mulligan if you're Patrick Chapin here in game two? Five land is it's a lot of land. Yeah, I mean, five, it's five land, two spells. You have to think about those. I mean, six land, one spell is pretty much an auto Mulligan. Sure. I mean, maybe you can paint a scenario where there's one spell that's so impactful in a match that you would keep it. But I, I mean, I struggle to think of one. So yeah, five and two, those are on the edge. He, I think he, the thing he, is that. Elspeth is great, and Bile Blight is relevant enough. You've got, you know, it's an above average two spells. And if you're going to four, are you really going to do better than two good spells? Right. And, and if you just, is there any extra value in seeing a sideboard card? Right? Bile Blight's a card he's gone, he's made, that's come at some expense to his main deck. True. So he sees that Bile Blight, he, he says, I wanted this here for these games, and seeing it, does that maybe, you know, make it count for a little extra of a card? Yeah, it means it's an above average spell. Now, that looks uh, much more manageable. Oh, yeah. Three land, three spells, Seder Wayfinder, Farika, God of Affliction there, Hero's Downfall. Uh, that looks perfectly acceptable. Thank you so much. Although, he's... Well, is, is yeah. he Hollywooding here? Yes. Okay. Yes, he is going to sigh and then keep. And Patrick is not buying it. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. He's not buying it. We don't talk a lot about Patrick's mental game, but it is among the best. Right. So here we go, Patrick Chapin underway with a temple. Yeah, and, w and one of those six lands was Scry Land. Oh, sure, even better. I remember a PTQ back in the 90s, Patrick Chapin played in the top eight. He convinced his, op his opponent to mulligan to zero in game two. He spent game one, he won with like a scroll rack to just put extra cards back into his library and like decked the guy all the way down to the bottom of both libraries, convinced his opponent that, you know what, if the opponent had just had seven more cards in his library, it wouldn't have been possible for Pat to win. <laughs> it's like crazy winner or prison lock. And he just literally played it out to the bottom of the library to try to trick the opponent. And the opponent was just like, I'm going to mulligan to zero. You can't win. Turns out when your opponent mulligans to zero, you, you can advance in the PTQ. Sp speaking of zero, that's how many lands uh, Shahar saw wow. off of his Seder Wayfinder here on turn two. Yep, you may put a land card from among them into your hand, but not if you don't see one. So we just have a 1-1 one, one in play instead. But we do have some fuel in the graveyard. Another scry land from Patrick. And uh, backup Elspeth is now in hand, uh, but we're going to see the first Planeswalker of this particular game being Ashiok, Nightmare Weaver. Uh, so Chapin will reveal the top three. It's a little better than the Ashiok Shahar had for turn three in game one. There was already a Siege Rhino in play by then. <laughs> right. Back we go to Chapin. So you get a look at Ashiok, Nightmare Weaver. That's what Shahar has in play, getting ready to do its thing. Course of Crucifix for Patrick. Oh, and there's a hero's downfall. Up oh, we go. Yeah. There, there goes a hero's downfall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a courser, which uh, therefore goes, as it were, under Ashiok Nightmare Weaver. Wow. And he turns his draw phase into a land while he's holding a bunch of land in his courser in play. Hmm. Ashiok doing work this game. Now, we've seen an ultimate on Ashiok Nightmare Weaver already today. But it was not on the winning side. No, it was not the way that game wanted to go for fans of the Greek team. 
Reminder for those of you just joining us, Denmark are the World Magic Cup champions for 2014. They defeated the Cinderella team of Greece in the final. A tremendous match and a tremendous tournament for both of them. But Denmark hold the trophy for this year. Who will join them in the epic photo shoot? Will it be Shahar Shenhar, 1-0 up in this best three out of five? Or will it be Patrick Chapin chasing down an elusive world's title? I like the images floating around Twitter already. Dane Blast. Yes. Choose one country, destroy the rest. Wow. Sh Shuhei, was, who's here at the Japanese coverage side for Nico Nico, yep. was running around saying Dane Blast at uh, <laughs> lunch. Corsair Crufix uh, is on top. Right. Place Corsair place Crufix from out from under uh, Ashiak Nightmare Weaver. That, that's Patrick's Corsair in play. <laughs> and uh, it, it also uh, finds him a land. Yep, they're in different sleeves, so hopefully that won't be an issue at the end of game two. Patrick Straw has not exactly worked out. No, it's not been great for him, not least uh, somewhat forced to happen by uh, Shahar, who is waiting patiently for Chapin to do his thing, which... Right now is looking like land number six. He's got plenty to choose from. Still, as it continues, the land windswept Heath, Erborg, Tomb of Yorgmoth available. And he is going to try and thin his library somewhat further. Right. He's going to play right into a disdainful stroke here. But needs to get something going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the fastest ever Elspeth that never even attempted to hit the battlefield. <laughs> he just he just kept like, tapped his man and put an Elspeth in the graveyard. Right. Yeah. Got the sideboarding report, by the way. Oh yeah. Yeah. Chapin took out all four Caryatids. He took out Brimaz, the one Wingmate Rock, the two Sorens, the Ajani, the one Murderous Cut, in order to bring in the Bile Blights, the two Read the Bones, two End Hostilities, the Utter End, the Dune Blast, and the two Anaphenses. So no Nissa, no Galare, no Liliana, no Cut. Uh, Eleven so, cards. Different. Uh, so while that's happened, uh, Ashiok has gone up, and we see now a Siege Rhino under the Ashiok, while Utter End and End Hostilities uh, are paired up in the Exile Zone um, as you look at the screen above Chapin's Graveyard. Shahar sideboarding, brought in the Ashok that we expected, brought in the Disdainful Strokes, the Soul, the Dig, the Farika, exactly the cards we were talking about. Did not bring in the Bile Blights or the Drown or the two Reclamation Sages or the two Sultai Charms. What's coming out is often more interesting than what went in. He trimmed half of his Karyatids. He took out his two Doomwake Giants, took out two of his four Sidisis and a Thoughtseize. Hmm. Chapin with five cards, but Shahar Shenha with a nice board position here in game two. Remember, he is one up in the best three out of five. Here we see Abzan Charm from Chapin. So he is going to go further into his library. Two more cards he gets. Passes the turn back with no land permanence. And Shahar here is, oh, he's got a Farika down there and is going to go, I'm going to Ashok down Siege Rhino. So I'll have that copy of your card as well. So half the creatures on the battlefield belong to Chapin but are sitting on Shenhar's side of the battlefield. How close is he to... Uh, being able to attack with that Farika. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, there Smash. it goes. 
the two extra pips off of the, that plus the Siege Rhino. Rhino and then two pips off of the Corsair of Crufex. That, lethal, right? That makes Farika a proper god. And Chapin is looking. <laughs> Doing some math. He did not think this game was ending this turn. Not that he, he has Bile Blight to keep himself alive. He can also turn off. Bile Blight Farika. He's going to cast two Bile Blights and he's going to kill the two Corsairs of Crufix. No, I think he's going to kill Farika. Oh, he's going to kill yeah. Farika. Okay. Well, killing yep. the Corsairs would also shut off Farika, but I guess he just wants to. He'd rather get rid of it. Yeah, I mean, he can, can get refill. It. He basically needs an end hostilities. Get anyway. the heck out of here. And, and we've already he's... seen one exiled with Ashiok. Abs on Charm. That is, he can Abs on Charm into end hostilities. But, I mean, he's going to need an end hostilities anyway. Definitely once Farika gone after that resolves. Mm -hmm. So, Chapin uses up all his spare life. Nope. And nope. does not find an end hostilities. And by 2 to 0... Shahar Shenhar leads Patrick Chapin, and he, this 21-year-old astonishing talent from Israel, is one game away, not just from two world titles, but say it loud, say it proud, back-to-back -back world titles. Wow. Just something that has never happened before. I, don't even think, I feel like it's not even been contemplated. <laughs> What were the odds? Somebody winning this tournament. I mean, only 24-person tournament, but still, the odds of somebody winning this tournament back-to-back -back is incredibly impressive. Well, a card that was a very impressive in Game 2 for Shahar Shenhar was Ashiok Nightmare Weaver. Why don't we take a look at the Planeswalker? Ashiok kicks off with plus two to exile the top three cards of Patrick Chapin's library. Uh, minus X, put a creature card with converted mana cost X, exiled with Ashok Nightmare Weaver onto the battlefield under Shahar Shenhar's control. That creature is indeed a nightmare for Patrick Chapin, it turns out, <laughs> in addition to its other types. And minus 10, as we say, we saw that earlier in the World Magic Cup final uh, with Greece, but it did not uh, play out. Yeah, that was that was actually one of the craziest sets of turns I've ever seen. The end of the World Magic Cup? Yes. yes. It yeah. was absurd. One guy has the game. You can't, I could not imagine the scenario. <laughs> it's like, uh, I, can, I can It was almost... like a runner, runner, runner into zero out somehow. I can almost see the meme. <laughs> you know, oh, you like top decks? I got top decks for your top decks for your top decks. Yeah. Yeah, it was Siege Rhino into Dune Blast into Wingmate Rock. You know, all predicated on taking uh, and it only... taking Disdainful Stroke with a Thought Seize at a point where you couldn't even win, where it seemed impossible. Yeah, it was, it was helped by the fact that the Ashiok that had been depleting the library instead got ultimated. Um, so then Ashiak was not able to put creatures into play right. because it didn't have enough loyalty anymore. Loyalty is very important. And I know that outside watching this, there are so many players invested, not just in a friendly way, but in hours and hundreds of hours and traveling to tournaments and discussing decks to these two players. Because although on screen you have a Patrick Chapin and you have a Shahar Shenhar, off screen, you have a support network of pros who are absolutely devoted to seeing their man claim the trophy well, here. This is this is Pantheon versus Channel Fireball Pantheon versus classic True. Channel Fireball team here. Sort of. Right. Sort of. I mean, the Pantheon kind of the, split up into different groups for this field. Sure. I mean, the Peach Card and Oath guys worked together. Uh, Patrick basically worked with Paul Reitzel. Right. It was, it was him and uh, Rietzel. Rietzel, uh, and then worked at home, you know, not at the tournament with Michael Jacob and Matt Sperling. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that was essentially Patrick's support network. Shahar worked with uh, with Josh Hunter Layton, with Tom Martell, and with uh, Paolo Vitor de Rosa and, and Willie Billy Adel. Adel. Willie Adel, who built this deck that he's playing right now. Yeah, and incidentally, congratulations to Willie Adel and Team Brazil for making it to the top eight uh, in a weekend um, of dreams coming true for people. Um, it is no doubt that the Brazilian team making Sunday was a huge deal, uh, and there's such a passionate community down there in Brazil. Uh, great job uh, to make it to the top eight. Well done, and uh, Willie Adel has a lot to be proud of. Yeah, I mean, let's, let's also congratulate Josh Hunter Layton on building the modern deck that helped Shahar get here. Throwing right. around some congratulations. I mean, Shahar went 3 1 with the modern Jeskai Sinisi combo deck that Josh Utter Layton put together. That team may have broken modern. There were a lot of people on Josh Utter Layton's team who decided to say on social media, 
Am I imagining things, or is February going to be a very good month? Yes. <laughs> the next Pro Tour is also modern, it turns out. So and having Josh Utter Layton on your team is a pretty nice thing to have going into that Pro Tour. Right. So, Patrick Chapin, O2 hole. Thinking back to another famous O2 hole, uh, Louis Scott Vargas. Mm. Uh, Randy, you and, I, you and I were in Berlin, and you know, look at, we were able to look out the booth, and one of the people you saw in the front row of that was Patrick Chapin. Sure. You know, rooting on Luis. Mm, one land hand. That's going back. <sighs> Straight away. Wow. Let's not forget that when Shahar was at two wins last time round against Reed Duke, we watched Reed Duke mulligan and mulligan <laughs> and <laughs> mulligan. <laughs> and not quite to three. I think four was where four, the, yes. the horror stopped. Th this that was has... game four, though. That's not, that's not an omen yet. Yeah, sure. this, this has been a match of parallels, though. You know, we, we talked about <laughs> you know, the rematch against the Israeli national champion. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's the same floor reporter in Tim Willoughby that was mm -hmm. there at Worlds in 2007. Yep. Shahar really, I mean, starting to build a legacy. I mean, win or lose this match, his ability to pilot these decks through this field is truly incredible. And, and keep in mind, you know, he, his Israeli team made a fairly deep run in the oh, World yeah. Magic Cup. So he was playing for every single possible day of this event. Today was, today's actually his least stressful day. It's funny. Yeah, he played every round. Yeah, I believe Israel actually had one of the best eight records in the field, too. I mean, the way you pick the top eight teams is, of course, with this potted system, which, which I happen to be a big fan of. You know, top two teams from each pod to advance. But Israel was, did great on day one, did great in their first pod, but they stumbled into an 03. What are the six cards? There's two land there, there's an Absan Charm, there's Utter End, there's Bile Blight, and there's Hero's Downfall. It's a Temple and a Windswept Heath. Now, what do you do here, gentlemen? I think he's keeping it. He's showing it to yeah. the spot. Yeah, I think you have to. Handshaking and a little bit. loosening the tie. Grabbing at the tie. All right. Okay. Here we go, Patrick Chapin. Can you keep World's Week alive? We've seen four, nearly five days mm. of action. Push to the bottom. And now there are no more results to come except this one, the final of the World Championship. Land from Shahar. You see his hand say to Wayfinder, Corsa, mm. Downfall, Tyrant, and Queen. I see a black mana source. Yes, off the top. You know, being able to cast that utter end to take out a whip, uh, you know, pretty crucial in mm -hmm. this matchup. Definitely. So, land number two and pass. Take a point. His Seder Wayfinder doesn't have to. Uh, Another whip? Huh. Wow. But still two lands in hand for, or one land in hand. Yeah, it did spell a queen for whatever that's worth. Yeah, Sadisi Whiff, not really uh, <laughs> delivering for Shahar uh, so far, but the whip absolutely has. And number three. Five cards in hand for Chapin. Having Mulligan to six. Shah having not gained a benefit from his Sator Wayfinder, other than I'll hit you for one. And, and stock my yard yeah, for later. Yeah. Not full value, let's say. And he's going to send immediately away for his third land.
You see the rankings of the players, both inside the top 25 players in the world, of course. Shahar at 14, Chapin at 19. Expect them to rocket up the standings <laughs> on the back of their performances this weekend because one pro point for every match win, two for each win on Sunday. As we see Farika, God of Affliction, on top of Shahar's library. And now a Corsa in play, that's why. We're going to see Brimaz here. Mm -hmm. Now, didn't Brimaz come out um, after game one? Am I imagining that? I'm pretty sure that's what we said. Yes, it so, did. Uh, yeah, so this is this is a change in, in strategy here for Chapin. Well, Pat Patrick said it was a, uh, even if he brings in the same cards every time, different cards come out depending on player draw, depending right. on what he's seen his opponent do. Shahar's out of lands, too, by the way. I mean, it may become an issue if Corsair can't find anything on top of his library. Right. I think we're going to see... We are going to see Brimaz. Mm-hmm. I mean, outer ending the Corsair is also a possibility. So let's see what's on top. It is not a land. It's a thought seize. Still no land for Shahar. Does have a downfall for the Brimaz. I mean, the only only spells. I guess he could play second Courser. Could play Farika. I gotta think he downfall Brimaz before tokens start flying everywhere. Especially as all you really want is time. Right. And that's what he does. For only the 394th time <laughs> this week, are Bueller correct about a line of play? Second black still eluding Patrick here. True. That's a good point. And now he is going to utter end the courser. Well, now he knows Shahar missed a land drop. He had not seen his hand. He didn't know that Shahar was so desperate for lands. Mm. The sequence makes a lot of play. You don't utter end it, but then when he's out of land, you do. But there's another question. Once again, uh, we're seeing oh, Shahar's lands land. do damage to him, though. He's taken a little bit from that land of war wastes. I think that land showed up just in time. Yeah. Chapin's not burning, though. This is not a succession of lightning strikes and stoke the flames in the future. Could be some Siege Rhinos, with bonus burn spell attached. It's a land for Chapin. And it looks like a black source. Yep, does turn his hand on. Interesting. Corsair kind of did the damage, got a free land. We also know there's a land on top. So Shahar's going to hit his land drop next turn, whether he has a Corsair or not. I don't know if it's worth killing that Corsair now. I think that that's what Pat's thinking about. Go Declines. ahead. Inside the draw phase. Yep. Now that I see that there's a land on top that you could play for free, I'm going to kill Corsair before you get the opportunity. So yeah, Patrick waited to see the draw phase, mm -hmm. and then did that inside. Still on top. Oh. I think we may see Sidisi here. Chapin at seven. Actually leads off with thoughts. He says, what are you holding? Hmm. Two Bile Blight and a hero's downfall. We've known that all the time. We didn't even have to pay life for it. I've got Chapin's new sideboard, by the way. Okay. Uh, he only has one End Hostilities in his deck. Oh, wow. And he only has one Elspeth in his deck. And he's got back the two Bramazes. Okay. The rest of it looks the same. Any changes for uh, Shenhar? Nope. Shenhar's like, that worked out perfectly. <laughs> so 
the scry. He knows it's a temple. He knows it's a temple of mystery. I think you want to draw land here, don't you? Yeah, that's what he. Yeah, it's even a scry. His, land, his right? instinct was to get rid of it, but now he's like, eh, on second yeah. thought, I kind of want that. Shahar goes to eleven. That's his uh, his lands doing him in again. But uh, again, I don't think Patrick can really punish mm -hmm. him, not without running siege rhinos. And Patrick draws for the turn. So now we know he only has one end hostilities. We know he only has one Elspeth. Yep. Uh, are the read the bones still in there? I know that's a card he really uh, yes. he really likes after sideboarding. He he doesn't have a lot of life to play with though. Oh, he's down to six. Six points away from a back to back world title for Shahar Shenha. Can he do it? It's pretty insane. Shahar's dad, uh, Ariel's been here all week. Yep. Along the rail, rooting on his son in the World Championship. We're rooting on the Israeli team in the World Magic Cup. Just like just, last year. Yeah. Un, you know, having uh, just an unbelievable amount of pride in his, uh, his son's success. It's been fun to watch. And I know Shahar's teammates have given him grief over the years. Lucky Shahar and little kid luck this. He's he's twenty one now. This is this is not little kid luck. Well he said the this little is, kid this little one kid is, luck ran out at twenty one. Yeah, There's this is skill. This is pure skill and it has really been a delight to watch. Is there a way back in for Chapin? Yeah, draw his one end hostilities. Here he's gonna bile blight. He takes Ouch. damage. We were Ouch. talking about mm. we were talking about the land doing damage oh, yeah. to uh to, to Shahar, but it has been it has been all pain for Patrick. Does kill the city. He's a response to the trigger, though, so no zombies. That one Seder Wayfinder, though, is, yeah, here's 25% of your life. Yeah, Patrick falls to three on the attack. Chapin draws a Siege uh -huh. Rhino. It's not an end hostilities, but it is an end being on three life. <laughs> you go, well, he goes to two yeah, for a moment. Two, yeah, and then up to five. <sighs> wow, the Shahar goes are on. to seven. Yeah, no, this is pretty tight. Siege Rhino's not small. Shahar. There's a seventh land for Shahar. It comes into play tap, though. A Soul of Innistrad and a Hornet Queen for Shahar. And the land to play either of them next turn, but well, he Soul can play Soul this turn. Mm -hmm. It's got to be the line, right? I mean, I guess the other option is to make tokens with Farika. Yes. So there's the Opulent Palace, land number seven. And Shahar has... A palace of riches in hand with that soul of Innistrad and Hornet Queen. Yeah, he wants to make death-touching tokens specifically. If he plays soul and Patrick can remove it and hit him with Siege Rhino, that's kind of bad. But he can make multiple death-touch tokens here. He'll get trampled over for a little bit, but he'll take down the Siege Rhino. So he passes the turn. Chapin has drawn a Corsa of Crufix for this turn. This is a man who will have to be carried out on his shield. Corsa reveals land. Land Game comes into play. Edge closer to parity at six to seven. But another land on top. Now he, can, mm -hmm. he can shuffle that away. Yep. Are you looking at a back-to-back -back world champion? 2013 over Reed Duke. 2014, two up and six life points away against Patrick Chapin. Or will the man who never knows when he's beaten find a way out from here? This one is not done. And Pat's got to figure out whether he wants to attack with Siege Rhino 
into the threat of death touching death touching tokens from Farika. He knows he would get to trample over, but he would also knows he would lose his siege rhino. It's a tricky spot. Yeah, first he wants to look at a fresh card. Yeah, let's see. What am I going to draw next turn? Let's find out this again. Some more information that might influence this decision. If he has like siege rhino on top of his library, then suddenly getting through four damage would sound awesome. It's hard to get through four though. What is it? Oh, still a land. He's got another fetch land, though. <laughs> he can repeat the trick. I don't know. How, how many forests and plains does he have? That's all of them. That's two forests, two, forests, two, forests, planes. two planes. That windswept heath is dead. All right. it does is reshuffle. Oh, that's that's the job he's looking for. I mean, it's still fine. Yeah, he doesn't really need the, <laughs> what, eighth mana here? The sum total of what he desires from it. It means he won't be gaining a life, though, from the uh, Courser, the way he did with the first fetch land. Mm. So go down to five in order to reshuffle to get information about your next top deck. That's what he's thinking about. His hand is, what, a single hero's downfall? Yes, which costs him two life, two life to cast. So many little edges. And Shahar's hand is absurd. All right, Siege Rhino's going in. Shahar's got... The first one is pain-free, right? First one is pain-free. A black and a green. Here, you see Farika. Okay. Its controller, its owner, gets a 1-1 one, one black and green. Yeah, he wants multiples. Not interested in taking trample damage, so he's going to put two in front. Hero's downfall could get it up to three points of trample. Super smart from Shahar. If he put one in front, you know, he would have... Run the risk that this hero's downfall could get him to three, which is kind of a magic number when your opponent has siege rhinos in their deck. Patrick's considering it. Knocking him to four? He says, no. okay. Yeah. No. I'm not sure there's that much difference between four and five. Trample over for two. Chapin passes. He has the lead in life. But Shahar has the lead in games, two to zero. <laughs> And the lead in Hornet Queen. Flying in creatures. Seven. Yeah. Oh, wow. That is not what Patrick wanted to see. Did he have All to right. take any damage to do that? I don't think, I don't think so. No, he did not. Oh, yeah, Opulent Palace. Opulent Palace, Temple of Mystery. Time and to crack forest. windswept teeth. Yeah, you have to, right? Yeah, he needs to draw he needs to draw basically end hostilities. I mean Bile Blight might be useful. He's taking six in the air. He's gonna just Looks like he's just nah. He's he no went way. to untap and then thought again. Well, he can but do it during now. his upkeep. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. actually matter. Okay, sure. So shuffle away off a windswept heath. When that deck reappears at the top left of your screen, we are going to be a top deck away potentially from a new yeah. and returning yeah. and repeating world champion. Yeah, in basically, Shenhar. it needs to be bile blight or end hostilities. Bile blight would drop him to three. And I he think would take read the bones, let him keep going. He would go to one. Dune Blast would also be good. He needs, ironically, to end hostilities Dune, Dune to Blast keep hostilities be, going. Dune Blast would be the Dune Blast uh, is uh, the best. Okay. What is it? Obzon Charm. Uh, Can he afford to draw two? So that comes into hand. On top is a land. All right. That gains a life. Obzon Charm would leave him with five mana. He can Obzon Charm. This gets him to seven. Dune Blast no longer an out, though. Oh, Another Obzon Charm on top. You see eight land available, eight mana. And there's Shahar, who's been so cool and calm and collected all through five days. Llanowar Waste pings away. Even he can see how close he is. That's the first card. Here's the second. It's not wow. in hostilities. Let's read the bones on top. Chapin at three. Shenha at Can't five. Can't do the next one. Hero's downfall is not good enough. Patrick's going to work through the math, and I think he's going to have to extend the hand. Five days. 
for this moment, for that not quite so young man. 21 and twice number one. He is your back to back world champion. Shahar Shenhar, Israel, do it. And Shahar claims the title over Patrick Chapin. And that is just an astonishing performance. Because there's the smile. There we go. 23 of the best players in the world, and you have to go through on Sunday, Yuya Watanabe, the 2012 world champion, and then Patrick Chapin in his second world championship final. And Shahar Shenhar is your world champion for 2014. Welcome back to the booth, Rich Hagen, sitting alongside the historian and the Hall of Famer. Let's, and we are done. BDM, incredible. Incredible. Two years in a row, he's had to go through a murderer's row, oh, yeah. semifinals and finals, to become the world champion. Um, just two unbelievably composed, dominating performances by a young man, uh, you know, who I think has still not hit the peak of his powers. <laughs> he's only 21. He's got plenty more years of great magic in front of him. Randy, thanks to you. Thanks to Brian David Marshall. Why don't we hand it back to the news desk? And that means it's time once again for Marshall Sutcliffe. And he did it. I, I almost can't believe it, but I also can at the same time. Shahar Shenhar is our world champion yet again. I was sitting here last year. I mean, it wasn't exactly this desk, but uh, and Shahar Shenhar won. He did it again. Ben, what did you make of the finals there? Well, I mean, obviously you saw, you know, Shahar drew a little better than Pat. You know, Pat had problems with taking too much damage from his own land, yes. losing all his end hostilities to Ashiok the previous game. But, you know, we saw some excellent magic. Some sweet, some sweet I mean, plays down the stretch. Yeah, if you even saw the last couple turns of that game, my first gut watching the game was, hey, why didn't Shahar just cast Soul of in a strat? If he has a removal, you almost won it in the yard. And then I quickly realized that I was, I was like, wait, wait, maybe Shahar is going to make two tokens and double block because... You know, one of the last cards your opponent could always have after they've had the opportunity to cast all their permanents is a removal. And, uh, you know, Char could definitely beat a removal there because he had Hornet Queen for the following turn, and he had Farik in play, even if, you know, Pat had a sweeper or something in answer to the Hornet Queen. So it was a great play by Shahar to play around spot removal there. If he single blocks that Siege Rhino, and then it gets Heroes Downfalled, he doesn't, he takes four damage going all the way down to like one. He doesn't have lethal on the following turn for Pat. He has Hornet Queen, but he doesn't have lethal. So then Pat gets to attack with the Siege Rhino and Char has to throw a ton in front of that or with plus two plus two from Abzon Charm or more removal, it could kill Shahar because Char's at one. So then that opens the door for Pat a lot because if Char throws a ton in front of it, the Siege Rhino can take out a lot of those creatures and then maybe Pat can go on to win that game, maybe. I mean, it's, it's a tough game for Pat, but maybe. Wait, the way Shahar made the two blockers and double blocked the Siege Rhino, making sure to kill it, kind of closed the door on that game for uh, Pat. And then actually, you know, we were watching, I was like, well, even if Pat draws end hostilities, he's still going to have to beat Farika. So this is a really tough game for Pat. Then he draws Abza and Charm. Yes. Yeah, and I'm like, that's actually the perfect draw. I mean, you'd rather see end hostilities because you could always just draw the Abza and Charm next turn. But that's almost the perfect draw because Pat needed more ammunition to be able to beat the Farika after end hostilities. So I'm like, all right, he draws Abza and Charm. He gets to put lands into play off the Courser and he gets the Abza and Charm. If he finds the end hostilities now, he might also find another spell off the odds on charm and his next draw step maybe he's still alive but then the end hostilities didn't come and you know shahar took the match and that was it shahar shenhar becomes our champion why don't we take a look at how he got there uh we had the top four bracket of course for the world championship in which shahar had to work his way through well one of the toughest possible fields in any magic tournament you could ever play right i mean you know oh. these these uh, world championship uh lineups are absolutely off the charts and you can see in the top four here that it was as simple as oh beating yuya Watanabe and then beating Patrick Chapin to become our champion. Of course, Patrick beat Kentaro Yamamoto from Japan. Japan putting two players in the top four, neither of them uh, able to make it into the finals, however. And we've got a new champion. Congratulations. Shahar Congratulations to Shahar. Well earned by him as well. Um, you said you were impressed by that, that last play. What did you make of the play overall? Oh, overall, it was very good. I mean, obviously, you know, Pat and Shahar, top players, you know, they've both been here before. I mean, Shahar won this tournament last year. 
And, uh, you know, la la I thought he was, uh, you know, a little bit of an underdog in this matchup, but it's standard, and I thought it was a close match. Last year, I thought Shahar was a massive underdog to Reed Duke in the finals. He was a huge underdog. And then and he was down 0-2, I believe, also. Yeah, he's so, incredible. You know, Shahar, you know, really playing great magic, you know, doing everything right, and, uh, you know, rewarded for it. Okay, well... We've got a two-time world champion back-to-back -back now. We haven't had that before. Never. Congratulations to Shar Shenhar. But for now, let's go over to Rich Hagen for the award ceremony. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the award ceremony for the Magic the Gathering World Championship 2014. We begin with our finalist, beaten but unbowed, winning 20,000 US dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, the innovator from the United States, Patrick Chapin. <laughs> Patrick Chapin, winning 20,000 US dollars. An amazing performance and an amazing player. But now the champion of Magic the Gathering for 2014, as he was the champion of Magic the Gathering in 2013. Will we ever see the like again? The champion from Israel, Shahar Shenhar. Okay. Shahar, let's do all this again like we did last year. Okay. First question, family in the building, once again, what does that mean to you? Everything. That was easy. And now we'll go for a slightly longer answer with, tell us about the friends who have helped to make it possible, because only one man can turn that final card sideways, but it takes a lot of people and a support network to end up with a trophy like that. Yeah, so I started off uh, testing with Paulo, Willie, Tom Martell, uh, and Raptor. And uh, just the uh, last couple hours, uh, Tom, Raptor, Hayne, Jacob Wilson. Um, I, I really don't want to miss anyone else here, but I think that, that was it. Okay. So um, what are you doing in 2015? Fancy another go at this? <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely going to go for it. Uh, I'm qualified now, so, you know, we'll see what happens. I'm not going to call anything. I'm not going to call anything. I'm not going to jinx it, so. Very wise, ladies and gentlemen, with his family and his friends behind him, once again, I can't believe we're saying that, the champion of the world is Shahar Shenhar. <laughs> Shahar, Israeli, good. Let's take you back to the news desk and Marshall Sutcliffe. <laughs> you heard it. Shahar, really good. Oh. It's not untrue. It's not untrue. I mean, we got to give it to Rich for that. It is, he is absolutely correct. Shahar, insane magic player, only 21 year, years old. We have a back-to-back -back world champion. BDM, I want to take a minute with you, though. We're actually going to get Shahar in here for, for an interview. Oh, sweet, sweet. But before we do, I wanted to ask you about some of your highlights. We had, uh, we were here since Sunday, right? Yeah. I mean, we've been here for an entire week. We had the World Magic Cup. We've crowned our champions, Denmark. And now we have the World Championship with Shahar Shenhar. Any highlights for the week from you? So many highlights. Right? So many highlights. I, know, I feel like I'm bombarding you. Like, yeah, hey, no, I'll just throw you under the bus with, you have to come no, up with no, your list I, and rank it now. I mean, absolutely. I mean, watching, it starts off just round, before round one of day one of the World Championship, watching play players open IRL Vintage Masters Pass. That was so sweet. Right? Watching Josh Utterly yeah. draft a Mox Jet, yeah. play a turn one Wild Mongrel, and make a turn two Arrogant Worm, <laughs> you know, thanks to the powers of cards printed first in 1993. <laughs> was a highlight. Right? That's just absolutely insane. Uh, Vintage Masters was a treat to watch, uh, you know, and we watched Shahar Shenhar go 3-0 in that format, mm -hmm. drafting goblins and, you know, contentious pick. He picks a, uh, you know, a chain lightning over a, uh, over a beetleback chief. Yes. Uh, you know, you can, uh, you know, watch his draft. It was such an exciting format. Yeah. Now, what about um, for the World Magic Cup? What were the things that sort of stood out to you from that? You know, 
I uh, obviously huge huge kudos to to Martin Mueller and the Danish team yes. uh, for being the World Magic Cup champions. But for me, uh, you know, the Dominican team that came in the, the Garrick helm and I you know, you stole and that for me. I didn't steal that. They they gave it to me. They gave it. They to gave you. that to me. They came over. They made a point of giving it to me because uh, I was so impressed with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know the, the the animal pelt over the shoulders. Um, you know the, the the Greek team in in their in their jerseys. Um, the the team Peru in their team Peru zip up. You know their I hoodies in red and the Guatemalan so team with the or, 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 and... Uruguay. So so unbelievable with, with their just how sharp they looked all week. Uh, I love the national pride. And then a step further than that, the teams that make it to the top eight, even if they don't make it through to the uh, to the finals and win, all of those teams, you know, Willie Adel bringing two new Brazilian players onto the Pro Tour. Nam Song Wook bringing more Korean players, more players from South Korea in his bid to get a, a, a Grand Prix in, in Seoul. Uh, yeah. get, get, getting more players onto the South Korean players onto the Pro Tour and exciting people at home. Um, Which is great. Such yeah. a great gamer culture yes. there too. So. Uh, I, just, I just love it. I, I love watching, uh, you know, the World Magic Cup as it just completely throws gasoline on the competitive fire for players in, you know, more than 70 countries all around the world. Yeah, you know, for me, uh, every time we leave uh, a World Magic Cup, I'm always left with a lot of images, and the images are usually a player playing and then his teammates huddled around, and it, it creates a certain electricity. You know, I get to be down in the feature match sometimes, uh, either running the feature match or doing the iPad down there, and... I, I can't. It's hard to describe how much different it feels. Well, you mostly know? you can't get close enough to see what the cards are because there's four people <laughs> huddled here. <laughs> right? You're too. like, hey, get out of the way. <laughs> right, but if you're forced to look at it and say, look at what's happening here. Like these are these are four minds, hopefully working together. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes well, they get in the way of each other. I mean, it was, it was really interesting. You know, we saw the Slovakian team that uh, you know made it into the quarterfinals. Uh, you know, we saw them you know, in the last round of the Swiss. Like not. No, nothing irreparable. We saw them get a little, a little, a little heated mm -hmm. with each other. You know, I said, "What are you doing? Why did you sideboard this way?" You know, yeah. and uh, there's a lot on the line. There was a, a huge amount on the line, uh, a huge amount of uh, data to process, and 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 you know, ex big differences in experience sometimes between the the captains of those teams and, and some of the other players. All right, I am told we've got Shahar Shanhar. Let's bring him on for his winner interview. Our new world champion, sort of. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. right there. Goes right here. I'll just, uh, you want to hold, I'll just hold that up for Shahar, you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. You are the congratulations. Thank you. Once again, talk us through uh, that last turn sequence as you were coming down the stretch against Patrick. Well, I knew what he had on top of his deck, so he had to sacrifice. So it's basically just ends hostilities or nothing. And the second I didn't see the ends hostilities, I thought it was over once he had Zen Charmed. Um, yeah, when I played the Horny Queen, he was at six life, and he had to take down two damage off if each black source he was playing, or three off abs and charm. So he went yeah. down to like three or four life, and yeah, he, he was dead from there. So no, what about the, what about the play with the uh, where he attacks with the Siege Rhino, and you have the opportunity to make those tokens? Okay, yeah. So if I that was super sweet. Yeah. So if I chump block there, and he heroes downfalls, and I take four, I go to three, and then I can die to a top deck Siege Rhino. So I just wanted to make sure I'm going to lock this up. And I had Hornet Queen and Sullivan in a shroud, and I knew he was really, really low and was down on cards. So I just wanted to go, if we have to, to a little bit of the late game if he draws the Siege Rhino. And if he doesn't draw the Siege Rhino, he's just dead, anyways. Yeah, that seemed like a really great play. Now, yeah. what was going through your head? Did you ever let it seep in, like, I might become the, the two time world champion? You're the first one to do that. Uh, <laughs> what was going through my head? Yeah, I don't know. Like, you know, I always wonder, like, when you're playing and you can see the finish line. Because when you're in the middle of day one, you know, you're right. just battling. Yeah, yeah. Right, it's not like that, but now it's like, wait a minute, I am really, really close to winning this. At what point does it start to seep in for you? Probably, uh, let's see, after I thought seized him and I saw Bio Blight, Bio Blight, Heroes Downfall, I thought I was going to win that game. That was I was a news. huge favorite from, to winning that game from there. Yeah. Now, your family's been here the whole time. You told Rich it meant everything to you. Yeah, I've can, only can answered that question 10 that? times. Yeah, I, wanna, uh, I want you to elaborate, though. I mean, there's a lot of people watching. And yeah, uh, my family is here. They came here all the way from Israel. Um, they wanted to visit, you know, uh, Nice as well. And we're going to Paris right tomorrow for the week. So I'm just going to go on vacation with them. My sister was in Berlin and then came here to watch me 
to watch me win. So uh, yeah, it's it's really really awesome having them here. My dad um, keeps me hydrated, keeps me you know <laughs> buys me food, gets us pizza. Like he bought the Israeli team pizza twice. Oh, we weren't even nice. hungry, but he bought it anyways. What about now? Uh, you played more Magic this week than that's anybody. That's what I was just going to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you have the, you have the, you have the, you played every single round of the World Magic Cup yeah. through Swiss rounds and pole play. Yeah. I mean, we're tired. We weren't even I'm, playing I'm pretty whole tired. Time. How are you feeling? I'm pretty tired, but I'm actually a little disappointed because I wanted to make uh, Israel, you know, I Israel even prouder and get the team into the top eight, which we were very, very close to doing so. Yeah, you had a fantastic show yeah. in the World Magic Cup. Yeah, something, 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 something leaving something on the table for next year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> winning, winning Worlds and the Team Magic Cup. That's the goal now. Yep. I mean, your, stand your standards have <laughs> risen, rising and rising. <laughs> Uh, I was just going to say, what, what, do you, what do you want to say about the, the team you got to play with throughout those rounds? Tell, tell us about yeah. Israeli Magic, how excited they are, uh, and, and you know where where. where uh, I have no where idea how excited Israeli Magic is right now. Um, I haven't <laughs> I talked to them. I guarantee you, they're very excited. But, and if you check your phone, yeah, yeah, they're probably I'm tweeting sure. at you like crazy. I'm sure. Um, yeah, the team was awesome. Um, uh, two of them were quite young, uh, 17 and 19. Oh, uh, wow. The blue black control player uh, played really really well. I never saw him make any mistake that I actually. Would have made my, wouldn't have made myself. Um, he played quite well. He got a little bit unlucky in the last couple rounds. Uh, I, was, I did too, and so did our teammate. Um, our other, uh, the 19-year-old was playing red-white aggro, and he also played played awesome. Like I, I was very impressed with with all of them. And the limited player, uh, of course, who was sitting out, I think he may have went undefeated in limited. So yeah, it was just, it was great. It was. I hope they're here. They, I hope all three of them stay next year. Uh, for the World Championship, you prepared for that event with two of your teammates from the Grand Prix, Tom Martel and Paulo Vitor Damodorosa, but also Willie, Willie uh, Adel yeah. and Josh Hunter Layton. Yes. Uh, talk about the process of the five of you guys working for this fairly small tournament. You guys made up more than 20% uh, of the field. Yeah. Um, uh, it's 24 players and oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a little yeah. less than 20% of the field. Yeah, it, last year it was, but yeah. it's 24 players, so having five people is not that bad. Four is probably the perfect number. I would say six is way too many, and then five is like either a little bit too many or just right. So uh, I probably want to do that next year again. Five, maybe four. Um, uh, yeah, so we met up, uh, Tom and uh, Raptor and I, Josh. Uh, we went to Ottawa and Strasbourg. And uh, then we met in Strasbourg, we met Willie Edo and Paulo uh, after we were, uh, you know, not in, in Strasbourg we met, but we also were testing on like Facebook and stuff. But we only got to test with them in person in Strasbourg. And then we met here in Nice for a little bit. And uh, yeah, that was it. Um, I have an important question, Shahar. Sure. You hungry? I'm starving. <laughs> He's always hungry. Your dad didn't bring you a sandwich? Yeah, Come on. He's probably up there, Shahar. I there goes his turn to the year award. Congratulations. Yep. You're the world champion. Everybody's proud of you. You did a great job. It's going to do it for us here from the World Magic Cup. I'm and also of course, hungry. you're hungry too? I am All right. Well, he's hungry too. Here, go buy yourself some more. <laughs> but for us, of course, we want to thank everybody here the crew, the judges, the players, everybody on the coverage team, our World Magic Cup champions, Denmark, our new world champion again, Shahar Shahar. Our new old world, yeah. world champion. And most of all, you, the viewer, thank you so much for being with us for this long and awesome week of magic. We certainly look forward to seeing you next time. For everybody I just mentioned, I'm Marshall Sutcliffe signing off. We'll see ya.